Now, inside the previous videos for Camera Raw and Smart Objects, I showed you a variety of different ways to do things. However, in this video, I'd like to put them all together into a single cohesive thought for you. We have this image of this rather interesting looking guy. And I would like to start making some color corrections and tonal changes within Camera Raw. So the first thing I know I want to do is bring down the highlights to bring back the detail within these jewels in his arm. So by pulling down the highlights, all that detail comes back to us. Now, once I do that, it kind of darkened up other areas. So I want to open up the shadows to bring that detail back in. And I want to push the blacks back down in order to create contrast within the image. So this is how it was before, and this is after. Before, after. Okay, very quick changes really made a difference. I would also like to increase the vibrance a little bit to give this image a bit of punch. But when I do that, I'm seeing this purple in the background going before the skin. So I don't want to do that. I'm going to go with saturation first. And that's not bad. This is still a bit distracting to me. So I'm going to go to a local adjustment. And this is going to allow me to paint with my brush based off of the last settings used. But since this isn't going to show me anything, I'm going to really bring it down. And then I'm going to paint over these oversaturated areas in the background. Now it looks a little funny here when I did it. I'm not going to leave it at 4. I'm going to change it to 0 and then bring down the saturation just a little bit. I just didn't want that as bright and pronounced as it once was. The next thing that I'd like to do is correct the fact that this image is so busy. I don't really know where to look. Am I looking up here at the face, down here at the jewels, over here in the background? I really don't know. And I'm going to go over to the graduated filter. This is just my own personal thing. I like to take it and drag it from the corner into the image. And then I'll change this from a saturation of minus 55, which is the last setting used to something more useful by adjusting the exposure and just darken that a little bit. If in this case it's getting a little too dark in the blacks but not enough in the lights, I'll grab the highlights instead and bring those down instead of quite so strong of an exposure. Then I'm going to do the same thing from the other side, bring that up and in. Now I'm sure you've seen other things that are radial filters, which basically they start in the middle and give you this graduated around the outside of the image. To me this looks a bit fake because it's pulling it in the same amount from all around the outside. I, I just don't buy that. So I much prefer using the graduated filter and coming in from the bottom corners, which just simply pulls your eye up into the image. To see the difference, I'll turn off the overlay and then go preview. That's before and that's after. Before and after. It's nothing that becomes obvious when you're looking at it, but it most certainly brings your eye closer to where you want it to be. And now in this case, I want a little bit more emphasis on the face, so I can use a local adjustment to do that. I'll come back to the local adjustments with a new adjustment brush, make it a little bigger, and then swipe down his face. Now when I do that, it brings in the old settings, so I'll change that to 0 and 0, and simply open up the exposure a little bit. And I'll even bring it down a little bit into his neck, just so that it isn't so obvious I'm focused on his face. So once again, that's a before and after. This is some minor changes, but when you do a lot of minor changes, it really helps the overall image. So this is pretty much how the image was before, and this is after I've made a few tonal and color changes within Camera Raw. So if I were to click Open Image, it's going to open the image as a flattened layer, and I don't want that. I want to retain all this information, so if I want to come back to it, I certainly can. So I hold down the Shift key and click Open Object. That's going to open the image up into Photoshop as a smart object, which I can start building on top of. So now I'm going to start cloning out some anomalies that I don't necessarily like in this image. When I hide the original image, you see that the top layer is blank. 
can tell it's blank because it's the checker pattern, which, which signifies the nothingness. And then I'm going to take the clone stamp with an opacity of 100% on the current and below layer. I'm going to zoom in on his face. I'm going to fix these reflections that are going on in the skin, as well as this particular eyebrow ring. Once again, if you would like to learn more about cloning, I have other videos on the website about cloning, as well as a two-hour video on the topic. It's also part of my Photoshop Perfection Basic One course. They can be found on my website www.theartofretouching.com. Okay, I fixed that. I'm going to remove this eye ring simply because I need something to remove inside of this image. Okay, so with that done, we have the blank layer which has the cloning done to it. So when I hide the cloning layer, you can see all the original data is still there, the eye ring and the reflections. I've simply hidden them. So I also need to do something very obvious for you. So I'm also going, going to clone out this particular area of his chest. And I'm not going to be spending any detailed amount of time doing this. Please forgive me. I simply want to create an illustration for you that you can use as a point of reference to see what's going to happen next. And that's going to make that blend a little better for me. Okay. So when I hide the cloning layer, you can see that the symbol is still there. And now it's gone. Now, if I want to make a tonal change or a color change to this image, now because I have two layers, it's a lot easier to simply use an adjustment layer, which can otherwise be found under Window, Adjustments, and simply grab the curves or whatever other tool you want to use and make that adjustment, whatever the adjustment is, because it's going to make this adjustment to all the layers below it. Okay, very simple, easy problem solved. Let's say that after we've done this work, now we want to sharpen it and potentially add some noise to it. Don't bother asking me why we want to add noise to it. I'm simply illustrating to you what is possible. So if we were to sharpen and add noise, we'd have to do it to two different layers. One is a smart object and the other is a cloning layer. And the problem here is if I add noise to this smart object, I can go filter noise, add noise, and we can add all this noise to the image and say OK, and it looks fine except for these areas that I've cloned out already because those are separate elements within Photoshop. See that? So the only way to correct this specific problem is to also add noise to this cloning layer as well. Filter, Noise, Add Noise, and say OK, and it goes away. The problem here is I've, I've added noise to that cloning layer, and it's a permanent change. See that? There is no coming back from it. Once I move on to other things, save the document, whatever, that noise has been added to that cloning layer. And if I want to adjust that noise after the fact, I can easily do it to the smart object by clicking Add Noise and pulling back on it. But as you can see, the, the cloning layer still has that noise hard-coded into that layer. So that's a problem for us. So rather than working this way, there are other ways to approach the situation. I'm going to back up using the History palette to before I added noise. So now offhand, there are two different ways we can approach this. One is taking this cloning layer and saying convert to smart object. So now what we have are two layers that are two smart objects. So I can click on this background layer 
and go filter add noise and it applies the noise to this smart object and I can click on cloning and filter add noise and add that same noise to the cloning layer so now we have two smart objects that have two smart filters that in this case are the same but I had to do it twice the benefit here is that I can double click on add noise and reduce that to 15 and click on this add noise and reduce that to 15 and then now they match again but this is creating extra work for myself so the easier way to make these manipulations is rather than having two smart objects with two sets of smart filters attached to them I can go back to where we were using the history palette instead this time we'll take these two layers convert to a new smart object this way the two different layers effectively become one now what we're able to do is select the one layer and add one noise and go OK. If we want to alter that noise, we can double click on the add noise, raise it up, and go OK. Now we simply have a smart filter attached to a smart object. Inside of the smart object, we have these two layers. And inside of this smart object, we have the original raw. So effectively, this layered Photoshop file has this camera raw information as a full file. Right here is a full file. And when we close that, this object is a full file with a full file inside of it. If you start thinking about it, the raw file is a full file, the first smart object is a full file, the second smart object is a full file, being saved as a full file. Uh, so these files can get large, they can be very slow to work with, uh, but there is a huge benefit in here in the non-destructive nature of working with these smart objects, being able to backtrack and make these changes afterwards. So that if I came up here and later decided, after I've added the noise and whatever, that I didn't mean to remove that eyebrow ring, I can simply double click on this smart object, which is going to open up smart object one in the cloning layer. And on that cloning layer, I can use my eraser tool to erase the change I made, close it, save it. And it's going to update the next file in the chain. It gets a little confusing at first, but once you start understanding how this works, Photoshop becomes this amazing tool for you. And you can work non-destructively and jump around between different stages of development within the image. And see, there you go. The change I made in the other file, once saved, propagated through. It put it back in, and it applied that noise to it, as well as this curve adjustment. Now, again, this gets very complicated. I totally and completely know that. But I hope that you understand it's well worth the time and effort to figure it out.